pretty today. Everybody get their picture taken with Elvis? I know somebody in here wants some money, so congratulations. Um, thank you for coming. We're going to be talking today about career path development. Has anyone in here, are you working as a nursing informaticist or have you ever wanted to work as a nurse informaticist? Great. The OR is a good place to start. I started out my perioperative career as a surgical tech back in 1980 when I was, it was funny listening to the CNOR prep course when they were talking about how um, dangerous ETOH is and um, we used to crack the glass canisters open with our hands and put them in a trash can and leave them there overnight to sterilize eye instruments. So um, back in the days when we distilled our own water and, and stuff like that. So I've been around for a long time and I currently work as an informatics nurse or a nursing informaticist for Empiric Health. So I started my career out and I'm not sure if there's a disclaimer here or not. So what we're gonna talk about today are the following objectives. We're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about the history of nursing informatics. And then we're going to talk about the knowledge base necessary if you wanna go after your certification. And it also happens to be the curriculum that they teach now in BSN, MSN, and DMP programs. I currently am a visiting faculty member at Chamberlain University teaching nursing informatics for the advanced practice nurse. So that's one of the required courses now for the master's degree in their program. And then we're going to look at how you can either take some tools to optimize your perioperative space or understand more about how you can work as a nurse informaticist in your space. So the history of nursing informatics started for me when I was in high school typing. And by the time that I got in nursing school, we actually had word processors, which was a big step up. And when I went back for my master's degree, I finally got to use an old Compact 486, the ones that sat on top of your desk. And now I have more computers than anyone needs to. I started my career off in Visalia, California, and it at Korea Delta Hospital, if anybody's from California. And when I was after I um, was when I was in nursing school, I was working as a unit clerk. So that was when we had to put all the orders in the computer. And that gave me experience that I didn't know would suit me so well in the future. So when I graduated from nursing school and the hospital started looking for an electronic medical record, they asked the nurses who had been former unit clerks to actually participate in that project because we had the experience of using the computers and I also knew the surgeons and nobody else wanted to work with them. So I got to do that too. So um, when I got to St. Francis Hospital in Columbus, Georgia, same thing happened. We were doing a system selection program. I was probably the only nurse in the OR at the time who even owned a computer. It was back in the 90s and we looked at OR system selection and so I was on that committee and then I got to implement that system. Um, it was GE Centricity at the time and I really loved working with my project managers and um, as some of you may know Marion McCall, she was a great project manager for us and I even hired her to take my place at my last job before I left. So um, the career has been really good to me and I, I get to stay in the operating room and then I also get to do something else. So did your nursing curriculum include any nursing informatics? Okay, bachelor's degree, master's degree. Okay. I would, um, last year I taught for CSU Monterey Bay in their associate to bachelor's degree course and that was the first time they taught nursing informatics so I did that for them. I want to move this ahead but I don't want you to see the answer. Okay the answer's not in here so I'm going to wait to move this ahead. Who knows who the first chief nursing informatics officer of all time was? Florence Nightingale. So, and seriously, Florence Nightingale, not a joke, and I'm going to show you why. So, in the 1980s, Florence Nightingale initiated data collection to improve outcomes. We all know what she was famous for, hand washing. But I'm going to come back to this chart, but I want to show you, this was, the, this was her graph she made. It's called a coxcomb graph, and she made this to track mortality. So, she was being an informatics nurse back in the 
1800s and didn't even know it. So some of the, the goldish colors are death from wounds in battle, death from other causes, and then the other colors are death from disease. And then she shows how many, um, the, the square price going out is the number of people died. So you can see she was even tracking mortality rates back then using charts and graphs. I found that fascinating. And they actually have these same graphs in Excel and Tableau now. Go back up. So in 1970, mainframe computers um, were introduced. You could start having them in your home in about the 80s. In 1980, nursing informatics, the definition emerged in literature and you started seeing it because with the beginning implementations of the EMR, there was nurses out there who were actually you, um, designing and building these systems and then using them. In 1982, officially, the American Nurses Informatics Association formed Caring, um, which is where the concept started to have a group like AORN um, for specifically for nursing informaticists. So um, ANIA was organized in 1982, and then Sue Newbold, if any of you know her, she's still one of the um, most prominent nurses in nursing informatics. She started that program. And she still teaches informatics boot camps. So if you you can just Google nursing informatics boot camps, just like a CNOR prep course. If you want to learn more about what being an informatics nurse is about, you can go to one of her boot camps or look at the curriculum a little bit more in depth than we're going to do today. So defining nursing informatics. Nursing informatics define, is defined by the American Nurses Association, and it's a specialty that integrates the science of nursing, computer science, and the science to manage and communicate data through information and technology. It only became easier to do with the introduction of the EMR. So when that all happened together, when nursing informatics was able to use data that they pulled out of those systems to facilitate that knowledge to support nurses, doctors, and patients to improve their outcomes. So this was supported through some information structures that we'll talk about and some processes and the technology that they had. And this is the official definition from the American Nurses Association. So like I said, this is the nursing informatics knowledge database and it matches the curriculum in nursing programs now. So if you're gonna go back to school to get a bachelor's, a master's or a doctorate, and you haven't had a nursing informatics class, this is what your um, course is gonna be based on. To get your nursing informatics certificate, you have to have an active RN license and you have to have a bachelor's degree or higher. Now you can work as an informatics nurse in a hospital. We're gonna talk about that without your bachelor's degree and without a certification. It's the function that you're doing, but to get the certification, you have to have your bachelor's degree. Some people, and I talked about that yesterday, um, you have to practice a minimum of 2000 hours and there's some other things that you need to do, just like with the CNOR to maintain that certification and it's five years. So do you think experience in your hospital as an informatics nurse is obtainable. Do you see any way you can get it? We're gonna talk about a little bit of that. So we're gonna break down the meaning of some of these terms and we're gonna start looking at the foundations of professional practice. So when you look at the curriculum for nursing informatics, it talks about professional practice. And professional practice is related to some of the things you guys are learning here today. It's how to be a leader, how to have management skills, and how to communicate. As you know from the people who taught you to use whatever EMR you have in your organizations, the nurses that were implementing those systems had to have leadership skills, management skills, process improvement skills, and communication skills to be able to do what they do. And then methodology and theory, which is one of the other foundations of nursing informatics practice, is a high level understanding of lean processes, PDCA or plan, do, check, act, or any performance improvement measure. 
Every hospital calls them a different thing. Some people use lean, some people use lean daily management, some people use PDSA or PDCA, but the methodology and theory is just doing process improvement based on whatever tool that your hospital uses. And then you need to understand rules and regulations. Um, a lot of things we've talked about this week are CMS and Joint Commission, and that's what this covers. CMS and Joint Commission, CMS has conditions of participation which relate to documentation, and so do, do the Joint Commission, just like the AORN recommended practices do. For instance, in the OR, it's necessary to complete an informed consent. Now, an informed consent is not the paper document that you have the patient sign. It's the communication between the physician and the patient. But the physician has to document um, in his history and physical that the procedure, all the risks and benefits and alternatives have been discussed with the patient. And that's the criteria that has to be met for regulations. So to be in nursing informatics, you have to understand what those regulations are so you can make sure one, that your electronic medical record is covering those things, especially if they're using templates to do their documentation. And you also have to do audits sometimes prior to the Joint Commission and CMS coming to make sure that the physicians are doing these things. Your post-op note, just like an informed consent, a post-op note, especially a brief, if they're just doing a brief post-op note, requires the pre-op diagnosis, the post-op diagnosis, and the procedure performed, and a lot of other things, but that's just a short idea, specimens and things like that. So now if you're building templates for the hospital or for Cerner or Epic or one of the other companies out there, you need to understand what those rules and regulations are to make sure that the software is able to handle those. And then interprofessional collaboration, you guys do this every day. It's you have to get all the parties involved to do performance improvement. So if you want to do something to address surgical site infections, you, have, you might want to talk to the physicians about glucose control pre-op, increasing protein pre-op, making sure the patient is taking their medications like they're supposed to take their medications. You need to talk to the whole crew in the OR about cleaning the room whether it's damp dusting or terminally cleaning the room, and then whoever's prepping the patients, and then caring for the patients afterwards. So you have to build interdisciplinary collaboration in everything you do now. So it's one of, what, it, what you notice is all of these foundations of practice, you're currently doing now. You just probably hadn't put a, um, a name to what you were doing, but they're the same foundations of practice. So, one of the other things that they talk about is system life cycle. So system life cycle for an electronic medical record is something that nursing informatics look at. And it's how you do use software to do performance improvement. And it's kind of the same life cycle if you're implementing any new service, any new project, or and you're using software to complete it. So can anybody think of a system they've recently um, implemented in their facility? You guys have all had Cerner and Epic forever, nothing new? Yeah, probation. Probation, and what does that do? And so that piece of software took a lot of planning and analysis because you have to learn their voice. You have to make sure that it goes in a certain order. And um, it's probably better than transcription because you can find so many spelling errors in regular <laughs> transcription. So you have to do your planning and analysis of the system and how you want it to work because then you have to design and build a system. So even if you get, well, Epic's not as, flexible as Cerner, but even if you get Epic or Cerner, there's going to be certain things in that software that you're going to want to make individual to your own organization. So when you're looking at pre-op workflow, you may have a robust pre-admission testing program that somebody else doesn't have. So you want to check and make sure all the documentation in your pre-admission testing process is in there. Um, I found out the other day from one of the students I'm mentoring is that sh their hospital is not using the patient handoff tool in Cerner. So that's going to be her project 
is educating the nurses what that patient handoff tool is, how to use it, and improve communication, and then improve patient outcomes in, at the same time. And she's using team steps to do that, which is another theory or foundation of practice. Um, then implementing and testing. So once you have the software designed and built, you're gonna want to get a couple surgeons to use that software for a, a week to make sure there's no bugs in it to work out all the bugs. Um, you usually have teams of people testing software. And then actually, did you notice how close this is to the nursing process? <laughs> that when you're done with all this, you monitor and evaluate the outcome of it. And then you're constantly going back and making changes to it. When you're looking at data management and healthcare technology, this is where teams have to learn that things change. And I know a lot of hospitals don't like change, but can you just imagine the change that's occurred in the last 35 years? And it's almost unbelievable. I can't imagine just being placed here now from 35 years ago and you know not having, I, this morning my phone broke. I didn't know how I was gonna get to the Verizon store because I didn't have a Lyft app on my phone. I had to take a taxi, it cost me twice of what it was. So I use technology in my real life and at work. So the federal government mapped out the process of how they wanted all this to happen through what is called meaningful use. Has anybody heard meaningful use? Yeah, yeah, got it. It's not even fully implemented yet. But as the government does, they thought this was a brilliant idea. So stage one focused on public or population health. Now, interestingly enough, I believe only one state so far has really understood what stage one was for. And I believe it's Florida where the hospitals actually send lab data to the state so the state can monitor if there's been an outbreak of a certain disease. Um, and then all hospitals send stuff to the CDC, but you're not required to have an automatic interface. You're required to send a, anything outside the ordinary. But Florida actually utilized that stage one to improve care for the whole state and actually streamline their population health by being able to look at lab results. Stage two provided incentives for organizations, hence the reason everybody in a hospital has an EMR now. Who here works in ambulatory surgery? Do you guys have software EMR or are you still on paper? Okay. You have paper? Okay, so a lot of times um, ASCs in the past haven't been under the same government incentives that hospitals have, which is why hospitals have adopted EMO, EMRs so much more rapidly than ACS. Now, the good thing is most cases in ACS go so quickly, if you don't have scripts built out to document your case, you're stuck in the room documenting your case after it's over. Um, but there are some really good systems out there to do that. Now, stage three, um, continue to build on communication and put increased pressure on maintaining the privacy with the transmission of data. So some of the things that you're familiar with that happened were you, you're required to send a discharge summary to the physician's office. And I think it made the national news last year that some fax machine somewhere was getting medical records from a bunch of people and it wasn't Blue Cross Blue Shield. <laughs> So it, what stage three did was since everyone had an electronic environment now, they really, really wanted to make sure people were no longer faxing or transmitting things that were um, HIPAA, and if they were, they were HIPAA compliant. Data management, we talked about this a little bit when we talked about um, Florence Nightingale, but data management, you need interfaces, usually unilateral, bilateral interfaces, just like you, um, your materials management system your, is usually separate in a hospital, but it feeds Cerner or Epic, so you can do your preference cards when you're in the operating room. So that's a unilateral interface. So all the supplies go into Epic and Cerner, so you can capture the supplies you use. Some hospitals have a interface that goes back, which would be bi-directional. So the materials management system actually knows what you use but most people just have them go through to do the charges and not do the, the interface. But you need this data so you can do an analysis. 
And um, as we talked about, Florence Nightingale started this, but some of the things that are important for surgery to look at from a data analysis are readmissions and return to surgery, because those are not outcomes. One, now you lose money if you have a readmission rate higher than you had last year, or you, you can't maintain what everybody else in your state is looking at. And then um, return to surgery, you wanna cut down on those because, well, because they're bad outcomes, but from a financial perspective, because it's like a, a never event or can be a never event, the hospitals don't get paid for like a surgical site infection. And then mortality rates are something that are reported for data management and surgical site infections is probably the most obvious one for operating rooms that get done. And those results have to be sent to the CDC. So, and then you have hardware and software peripherals, which I'm sure every single one of you have in your bag. So you're nursing informaticists and you don't know it. It's a pretty basic understanding of just desktops, laptops, tablets, cell phones, and how those different things can work. Um, Microsystems was in here and reminded me to ask you guys, do you guys have barcode scanners in your operating room for supplies? It's, it's I don't understand. People are like, well, they don't always work. It's like, yes, they do. Just plug them in. Do they plug and play? Just put them in. If it's nothing more than to put your cursor in the bar that has the serial number that's this long and go beep, you don't have to type it out. But, and Epic and Cerner both have the ability to capture. So um, if you don't have those, go back and ask somebody, if find the nursing informaticist at your hospital and talk to them about putting barcodes in your operating room. It's critical for implant documentation and supply documentation. This for implants? Hey. So you can, right. Well, even if you have them then, if you put your cursor in the box that says um, lot number, you can barcode that lot number and it'll go in the box so you don't have to write it out. So even if they're not putting in the catalog numbers, you can still save yourself some time from documenting that 50 ledger um, implant log. And so the pathway to a perioperative nursing informatic career can be done in your current role. So who is a super user for their software system? Okay, a couple of you. You were being a nurse informaticist. You were learning the software. You probably helped design it if you found flaws in how it worked. I know you tested it and then you helped implement it. So you were a super user. Um, some I wish more. Some hospitals actually kept the system administrators that implemented the systems and didn't send them back to the operating room to work. So you could maintain what you had already built. So who in here maintains preference cards? You, anybody in here update your preference cards in your systems? So you are working as an informatics nurse because um, the preference cards are definitely a part of the EMR. And so when you're going in to update them, you're not only improving efficiency because a, a card makes the case go smoother. It makes the patient safer because everybody has what they need in the room. And it improves efficiency on the back end because you're pulling less things from central supply and not having to return so many things to central supply. So just some of the ways that you can work as a perioperative informatics nurse in your current role. Do you guys have performance improvement committees that you might sit on? And in your performance improvement committees, you look at data. So you are already being an informatics nurse. Now for professional development, most BSN programs now require informatics in their coursework. Um, there's a lot of continuing education. If you're really interested in learning more about it, I join your local HIMSS chapter. Or if you're fortunate enough to live somewhere where there's an active American Nurses Informatics Association, and HIMS has a nursing, HIMS is a lot of different medical information systems, but they have a specific nursing track, which is really good. And then networking, coming here, listening to these programs. I, there's another one going on tomorrow that you can go learn more about nursing informatics. And you can also, there's a lot of people on LinkedIn that you can network with, and there's a lot of good information out there. 
So I want to know from you guys what you see as your biggest opportunity of improvement in the perioperative system that you have. So clinical functionality, what's something that you really feel could be improved in the EMR systems that you have? Preference cards. Now, is it the fact that the preference cards aren't right or the preference cards system doesn't work? Okay. Okay. So perform a great routine class performance improvement project is that you can change the way preference cards are set up. It's not that it's done. There's a whole bunch of different reports. But for our client that I work with, they didn't know that you can print out the cost of the supply on the preference card. So we're working with the preference card optimization. We sat down in front of the surgeon and he said, I didn't know how much it got to cost $690. So what's another example of clinical functionality that you may think that well, you need to establish a state um, kind of go with, with what what she said would be our hospital has a lot of problems uh, with sort of the supply chain management. So we're we're constantly running out of these things that when you go and you talk to your supply chain, you're like, you just don't use that many of them. You use like Yes, we do. So I'm like, but the problem is they can't see our end of the charting. They can't see that this is getting used. Because they don't have a buy direction. Exactly. They don't see our, our equipment used mm -hmm. versus some other things where it just, you you use it once and the doc's like, yeah, maybe I have that my preference card. And that's the only time you use it. And now we're, we're pulling and replacing it mm -hmm. three times a day. Mm -hmm. And again, those are things that with the knowledge that you bring as a nurse informaticist, one of the things that we do um, as a consultant is supply chain is usually thrilled to have a clinical person who can help them. I and mean, you were talking about yesterday um, in the CNO workshop class, you were talking about um, working with physicians. And um, the doing like value analysis and stuff. But, and, oh, you know, she was talking about going out and talk to uh, pathology because nobody ever talks to Supply chain is kind of the same way. If you want to sit on a value based um, committee sometime, the supply chain people love input from clinical people. And they also love to have a resource that they can say, you know, this doctor asked us to order this. and. I, I just don't know that he's going to use it all the time, but I don't know what it is. So you form those relationships and then you can have some of that um, functionality. So the uh, one of the things that I did when we worked with Tenant Health is there was not an alert in Cerner for um, sepsis if a the lactic acid number was high to automatically trigger a redraw to that. So we added that to Cerner and they uh, mapped it out through all the tenant hospitals. And which, so that's a great improvement for something that a nurse noticed. And a nurse worked with the lab, a nurse manager worked with the lab who worked with the clinical informaticists to get this done. So there's a lot of clinical functionality feedback that you can add. Financial reports. What type of financial reports do you think would be good for the operating room? Besides productivity. Because he's going to yell at me 
If I don't open up our monitor scaffold because we may need it, it takes me five minutes to set up. But if you do it costs $700, you might wait that couple minutes. But do you always need a suction irrigator in the lab after you or is it just something you just have it thrown away? Is there heated insulation to you in your packs? Does anybody know how much heated insulation can be cost? 60 bucks. Do you know how much regular insulation can be cost? Six. So there's all sorts of things that you as OR nurses understand that why are we using this? Or could we hold this? Or do you really want it on your card or do you just want it available? We can go through a preference card and compare if you have pull the reports from Ethic or Stern that can give you the costs on them or the average cost per case, find the lowest guy and find the highest guy. Compare their preference charge and just sit down and talk to the doctor and say, did you know this stuff was this expensive? We're working with a hospital right now who is a two hospital system. One hospital has its own vacamycin, genomycin, and And the other hospital pays $260 a box. So $60 versus $260 is not a hospital policy. It's a compounding. I can't find any literature in the evidence-based practice that tells you not to. All they do is tell you that they change the set time, so it's something you need to be mindful of, but there's no evidence to suggest that you can't do it. There's no evidence to support the heat and insulation tubing keeps patients warmer when they get back to There's um, some people think it can help in the fall, but there are types of store folks, store formers out there that are still a heck of a lot cheaper than a piece of sixty dollars insulation tube. So we save this hospital like two hundred eighty thousand dollars a year by just telling the physicians. And it's funny because if you walk up to the physician and say, you know, you really need to get an insulation tube, he's like, what are you talking about? I, I just know that gas comes out of this hole and I don't know. So it's funny because the C suite and supply chain are scared to death. To talk to surgeons, they're scared to death to walk across that red line. So to have people like you who have those relationships with surgeons and can have some of these conversations, it's really, really helpful. So what about operational opportunity, workflow? What is the biggest bane of your business? Turnover. I hate setting turnover because it depends on the case. It depends on how many people are about to help. It depends on if you have your insurance from SPD. It depends on if the preference cards were right. It depends on. Are you taking the preference card or two? Yes, or 10 page preference card. <laughs> but a lot of the operational workflows that we can help from perioperative services perspective are working with the pre op nurses. So, how often do you go to pre op in your patient's practice? Who's still sharing patients in the operating room? Okay, that's one of the things you can do. You can volunteer to educate the pre op nurses on how to prep, where to prep. You know, maybe you give them a little preference card. But so when we look at operational opportunity as a nurse informaticist, we look at time to surgery. So is everybody coming in two or three hours before surgery? Or can you streamline that process and get them in an hour before? It improves patient satisfaction. The families don't have to wait as long. And I know there's a surgeon who says, I want everybody to get one person to handle it. But you have to walk around with that. You think that's real work with you. Another workflow that we look at is case time. Because when you're looking at cost per case and you're looking at your case time, they'll be the guy who says, I use that no longer scaffold because it makes my case faster. So you always want to have the data. On um, his case time, the guys should self do What we also have the opportunity to look at when we work with anesthesia is PACU time and PACU output. So we learned a lot in the CNOR class about hypothermia, vomiting, hypothermia, and we can do a lot of things in the operating room, especially around hypothermia, and work with our anesthesia providers to control better post-op nausea and vomiting. Now, the biggest thing that has helped us in the short term has been the opioid epidemic because everybody's looking at multimodal opioid things to um, decrease the use of opioids, and those patients are going out of packing costs. 
The other thing you can work on a project with is length of stay. Because length of stay can start in pre-op. So do any of you work in pre-op at all? Sometimes? So having a, a good educational pre-op program so the patient understands, yeah, I know your mom had a total knee 10 years ago and she was in the hospital for four days, but you're going home tonight when the surgery is over, or you're going home tomorrow as soon as you walk up to the stairs. So making sure that that pre-op education process is there so that person knows they have to go home. Maybe you implement a joint program. If you do a good bit of total joints, maybe you have everybody come in on a Monday to a one-hour class so you can go over what, how they need to set up their house and different things like that. So a lot of the operational um, workflow opportunities that the hospital needs to work on are around um, perioperative services. Now, one of the things that is so important about doctor preference cards is if you can clean up your doctor preference cards and have the conversation with these surgeons about their cost per case and actually get those things changed, you'll save the money it takes for an FTE because you're talking two and $300 average per case. And if you're doing a high volume of cases, then you can pay for that FTE that is dedicated maybe to cleaning up those preference cards or that is dedicated to making your EMR work right. You may be able to justify your own job in, in the operating room as a clinical analyst for perioperative services or just go meet the perioperative or the clinical analysts in your hospital and say, what do you want to know about the operating room? You know, have lunch with them someday in the cafeteria. So we talk about this a lot already, but optimizing your current system from a clinical perspective. We talked about alerts yesterday. Um, alerts and required fields. If any of you have been around AORN for very long, there was a running joke, um, especially for Syntegrity, when I was on the task force that um, commercialized Syntegrity, there was literally hospitals who had 47 different colors of urine in their system. So when the nurse went in to select yellow, pale, there was this long, long list. And so there, and there are alerts that need to be a required field. What is one of them? Allergies? Height and weight? The height and weight alert before you get the medication if you haven't filled it out yet? Anything else? Hmm? Okay. How about new class? No, because there are cases that don't have <laughs> Okay, not applicable. All right, yes. But just because there are some folks System, a lot of people assign a hysterectomy as two, a cysto as a two. Now that's great, depending on that, we're going to change it. But okay, because they weren't always right. That's why you all need to be in medicine because operating room nurses need to do this. One that we see, uh, my hospital is. Part of our, our magnet thing, our, our QPI thing requires all of the OR nurses to audit a certain number of charts from the peers. And I started tracking other uh, relatives the other week. And um, we were doing this to see what am I what am I finding as errors in the chart? And I found uh, wound class was my second most audited incorrect mm -hmm. field because what Smith and I were saying, it'll be a we started out with, say, 
Coil of cases, but it turns out it's now coy stipe. So now we just went from we went to two to three, but they don't go back and change that. Right. And the room class is reported to the CDC and then they say NSA. If you can figure out a um a story, that is a great your suggestion is a great use of natural language processing. So as I could I've been a nursing as a for 25 years and I learned, learned the term natural language processing about six months ago, where you can make trigger words. So if something says ice, that it will it will alert you. But you need to talk to some technical skills about that. You can read what you already can decide, you can decide. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. I, I'm sorry. Yeah. That's just what she said. That's just what she said. And you know what? I worked in so many hospitals where you don't do a debrief, it makes me cringe. Um, so, safety checklists. We all know the most famous one, and you now do debriefings at the end of your case. So, that's awesome. Um, and it's really good. If somebody who's building these programs has a person who works in the operating room who can add value to these conversations, redundant documentation. Anybody have to do that? Redundant documentation. So the pre op nurse has already documented all this stuff and somebody didn't set up to float over into this machine. Well, it's a bad thing. I have no idea what else is doing. Okay, good. Um, from a financial perspective, we've already talked about the importance of Dr. Preference card accuracy, not only from an efficiency standpoint, but a lowering your cost per case and a productivity standpoint. Barcoding, we've already talked about that. And then there's always the pain in the butt point of productivity. So there are a lot of systems out there who will provide productivity reports, and which is why some of us always have to go home at one o'clock in the afternoon when our cases are open. But if we can justify to the management and to the leadership how the work that we're doing, whether it's a performance improvement project, whether it's cleaning up preference cards, whether it's going down to the unit and talking to the surgeon and showing them these preference cards, you can justify being there and being productive after the cases are closed because eventually they will realize that that, that is money saved for them. Operationally, scheduling accuracy. Who has RN scheduling cases? A lot of people do because the cases sometimes get scheduled more accurately if you have an RN. Because not only are you scheduling the case, you're scheduling the laterality and you're selecting the preference card, which is another reason for preference card accuracy. How many people know they have preference cards and search to be dead? You do. So so you need to go in and clean up those Dr. Preference Card files so the schedulers aren't assigning the wrong preference card. Tracking board utilization. Does everybody have a tracking board out in the patient waiting room? No. And I've seen the tracking board next to a whiteboard. So, yeah, I know. You some of the school like um, So having the tracking board utilization as a as an operating room nurse, it's really helpful if you encourage your peers to do um, just in time documentation. So don't wait till the end of your case because the tracking board is showing, may not even be showing you in the operating room that you're not having to do a mark time. The one out in the lobby will tell the patient if you start closing, but you have to push the button to document the time to start closing, and it updates the patient that you're closing or when the patient's left the room. It's really a good thing to get used to doing is you know having your case open when you go get the patient when you come in just click the button you and i know everybody always asks me to see you so you have the same time but the main tracking points of getting the patient in the room when you're closing so everyone knows so they can prepare for the next case call the patient if they're not here it's a very important um part of using your electronic medical record and then reporting so there's a couple different kinds of reporting. A doctor preference card is actually a report. It, because, and you can change the way it looks in Cerner or Reddit. And it just prints out. Um, a author is a report. It's something that prints out. 
And then there's reports that are in graphs and charts. So understanding the different kinds of reporting and how things are reported. So when you look at mortality, like Florence Nightingale used to do, she wanted to know what types of patients were dying and the frequency they were dying. And if she put something in place, how she could reduce that. And she saw a lot of reduction when she washed her hands. The example that we learned in the CNOR yesterday, it still makes me cringe, is that a lot of mothers were dying, hundreds of years ago, were dying at, um, after childbirth because the physicians were going to more into the living baby. Yes, yes. And some of them are for that. So, um, reports in the operating room are critical because, again, surgical site infections, um, post op sepsis, post op mortality, turnover times, and um, length of stay can all be things that we look at in the operating room or related to the operating room. So, driving change. change like I said, change is hard. It's really hard in the operating room. How many of you in the last week heard somebody say, because we've always done it better? Isn't that frightening? It is absolutely frightening. So it's there, when you have aspirations that you want something to change, you're gonna to have to identify your pain points up front so you know what you're gonna to have to deal with. When I'm talking to surgeons about, you know, using a harmonic tablet that costs $700, and he says, well, it makes me do my case faster. No. Or I talked to him about using antibiotic long and he's like, well, my infection rates are lower than the other one. Well, the AARS says that uh, you should help decrease surgical side infection. No. <laughs> so there, it's really good to understand what the pain points are going to be ahead of time and come prepared for those. What I learned getting my doctorate a few years ago was that physicians respect evidence-based practice. If you're going to have a, a conversation with a physician, try to find data that backs you up from their organization. So the American College of Surgeons, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, find the organization that your physicians are a member of and find evidence-based practice to support that. A lot of nursing informatics is utilizing and implementing evidence-based practice because you can find out what's worked in the past by doing the literature search, you can find out from reports in your facility what needs to be addressed from a performance improvement prospect. And then the culture has to be ready for change. So I'm a consultant. Operate surgeons don't like consultants. Hospitals don't like consultants. OR directors don't like consultants because I knew everything they're going to tell me. They just never give me time to do it. So when you so the company that I work for to sure that we don't like consultants um, culture is we put operating room nurses in the operating room, not um, fresh graduates out of college who don't know anything about an operating room. I actually had a consultant tell me one time that she wanted a copy of all my preference cards. They were still on five by seven cards. And she literally sat in the back of the operating room with a scanner. They don't provide you with any data. How are you going to look at them? So you have to understand the culture and understand how um, apt they are to change and what you can do to help them change. Teamwork. Again, if you just go talk to somebody in the supply chain, if you just go find your clinical informatics nurse and say, you know, can we talk about what you're doing in the operating room? And I'm, I have some ideas that might be able to help you. And you can work those things out. Like I said, the, the handoff report that, that's not used on the med search floor, I don't understand how somebody didn't know it was there. And it's maybe because someone didn't ask. And then um, evidence-based practice, again, is a huge part of nursing informatics. OK. What aspect of the perioperative system, there's, this is not a right or wrong answer. What aspect of the perioperative information system would you prioritize if wishes were free? Clinical documentation? Implementing a barcode to make this easier? Updating your preference card to make this easier? Patient tracking for communication of patient outcomes and reporting. There's a great reason 
to work on projects that affect all these. And working on these projects, all are the role of a nursing informaticist because you are the expert in perioperative services who can communicate with the people who are doing this. And they may not know you're interested in it. There's a whole career out there in nursing informatics for you if you want to do it. I didn't know it was a career path. It worked out well for me. I hurt my arm in the operating room and um, I had to go on light duty. Well, there's not light duty in the operating room. You can't even work in sterile processing anymore if you're on light duty. But I could update parking cards. So it, it worked out beautifully for me. After the implementation of the surgical system, I went to work for an electronic medical record company and now i work as a consultant in the field but when i was a director of surgical services i spent part of my time helping them implement surgery because i was a perioperative expert when um, i was working at tenant as a director of quality and nurse management i had to work with the infection control nurse because how bad the wound class documentation was and go give um, education to the perioperative team on how to, why it's important to document wound class infections. I would run reports out of the Cerner and just send them to the operating room director and say, you know, you really need to see like your documentation, which is one of the reasons I left the director of quality and management role because I think I was driving the OR. Like, you know, I'm just going back to the OR. Put that in. <laughs> Okay, in the slides, there's references for you to use. Um, and the Nursing World Certification through the American um, Nurses Credentialing Society. And AORN has a lot of work on nursing informatics. You met the woman from Syntegrity. Um, and if you're not aware, PNDS used to be a big book and nobody knew how to use it. And now it's implemented within Cerner within EPIC, within surgical information systems. So when you're doing care, you're actually getting credit for the care that you do to protect your patients from injury and things like that. Any questions? Thank you guys. Come see me if you're interested in being a nursing informaticist. Like I said, I'm not here to sell anything, but we can get a sign-up sheet. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I <laughs> and it's a report, actually. She was asking if I knew how to change the preference card. And that's the truth. Um, so that's my. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you my card. Send me an email, and I'll send you the report in it. Because we just did it.
And somebody tells me you can't. Thank you guys all very much. 